Well, this video will cover Kano diagrams, and we'll begin by talking about uh, a gentleman named David Garvin. Dr. Garvin uh, published an article in Harvard Business Review in 1989 that has kind of set the standard in terms of what people uh, think of, of in terms of quality. And when we, when we talk about quality, it turns out there's a lot more encapsulated into that word than you might feel like uh, there is. We as engineers, or the design team, if you want to think of us as working on a project and viewing quality in terms of that particular project, might define it as the totality of features and characteristics uh, of a product or service that satisfy the customer needs, whether those needs are stated or implied. Well, Dr. Garvin determined that really there are about eight things, uh, these very specific eight things, that when people talk about quality, particularly end users, customers, lay people who are going out to buy a product or a service, whether or not they are stating these things explicitly, it turns out these eight things are figure very prominently in their perception and experience of quality. And of course, performance is clearly going to be one of them, uh, how well the, the product operates. and we as engineers want to pay particular attention to those kinds of things because they're typically measurable. We can take that performance metric and quantify it. We can attach numbers and units to most performance metrics. Additionally, there are features, and those are things that supplement the basic function but aren't uh, necessarily required for the performance of the function. For example, heated seats in your vehicle. It's a nice feature, particularly uh, in the wintertime when it's cold. Uh, but doesn't have anything really to do with the uh, performance of your of your car. Certainly doesn't impact horsepower or some of the other performance measures that people look at when they're considering the purchase of a vehicle. A reliability is another one of those, and that's simply the probability of a product or service surviving to its intended design life. And that's one of those things that's implied but isn't uh, necessarily spoken all the time. People certainly expect something that they're buying to laugh, last within a reasonable period of time. And if it um, is becomes not usable or not function, functionable in that period of time, uh, then we say it, it's exhibiting poor reliability. The probability of it surviving to its uh, lifetime uh, was turned out to be uh, statistically better than it actually was observed to be in the field. So that's reliability. Durability is the amount of use of a product or service up to the time that replacement is a better option than repair. And this is all something we're probably familiar with. We want to keep using that product or service as long as we can, but up to a point, particularly in the case of something like a vehicle, for example, uh, we get to a point where the maintenance and upkeep of that vehicle are not, are more expensive than actually maybe considering the purchase of a new or used vehicle. So that's durability. That's also one of those things that figures very prominently in the perception of quality. Serviceability, uh, the ease and time to repair something. And it also um, matters very importantly about the people that are doing that, if they're perceived as competent and uh, friendly and willing to help people. Uh, conformance, that's something that we don't really think about because we just understand that, for example, if I buy a car in Ames, Iowa, and I drive it to Los Angeles, California, that vehicle uh, would uh, ostensibly meet all of the uh, emissions requirements in California. Well, they may well not, but um, it's an expectation on the part of people who buy products that those products are going to meet certain safety standards or certain performance standards. Certainly aesthetics, that is definitely something we, we think of, uh, how a product looks and feels, and we're all familiar with that new car smell uh, that we uh, look forward to after we buy our vehicle and uh, get into it for the first couple of times. And then there's perceived quality, and that depends a lot on reputation, but that reputation, of course, is built on the history of uh, performance and service. So those eight things, when we're talking about quality or when consumers and users talking about quality, uh, we need to remember to superimpose those eight things on the definition of quality. And so how does this Kano diagram help us do that? 
Well, it's a graphical representation of customer satisfaction, and it's on a Cartesian plane, and the vertical axis is the um, satisfaction of a product or service, and the horizontal axis is the um, perception of performance and quality of that product or service. Well, what's it help us do? Well, it helps us prioritize customer requirements. It also uh, helps us make sure that we don't overlook features um, that, we, that no one has stated, but that they're implied or that uh, we need to consider, although they may not have been explicitly uh, talked about in the design process. Um, it also gives us an opportunity to start thinking about features or functions that our competitors don't have. And of course, if we can introduce those features and functions at a comparable price to the existing or the competitive product, then we can uh, capture that part of the, the market. And it gives us an opportunity to invent and innovate, basically related to item three there, where we get to brainstorm on uh, features and functions that may not add a lot of cost, but that would really impress and surprise, pleasantly surprise um, customers. Well, this is a Kano diagram, and again, the vertical axis is customer satisfaction. The horizontal axis is the quality perception. And again, it's let's think of those eight things like uh, obviously performance, but also durability, reliability, conformance, and so on. The line through the middle um, is uh, what we call a one-dimensional performance metric, and it's um, just the better something is, uh, or, the, or the better response time maybe you get um, at, a, at a help desk or something like that, the faster that is, then the more satisfied we are. So it's just literally the better the service, the higher the satisfaction, or the better the quality, uh, the higher our satisfaction. Well, let's start looking at the regions on this. And we have in that fourth quadrant down into part of the third quadrant what are called must-have features. And what this area of the Kano diagram is reminding us of is that no matter how functional the product is, you'll notice that part of that curve is actually in the, uh, in the, in the fully functional or fully implemented high quality performance axis. Um, but it doesn't matter uh, if it's something the customer expects that isn't in our design or process. And so a good example of that might be if you're if you're buying a vehicle and you're told by the, the dealer that a muffler on your car is not standard and that you have to pay more than the sticker price for a muffler. Well, that's certainly uh, a must-have feature, and uh, it's certainly something we expect. And it's uh, needless to say that most of us would uh, just walk off the lot and nullify the deal at that point. Uh, so that would be an example of a must-have Feature. It's expected. Um, it's not even really discussed uh, uh, in a lot of degree because it's uh, it's implied that it should be there, and if it's not there, the customer is going to be uh, very dissatisfied. The second region we want to look at is made up of quadrants one and two, uh, and it's called the attractors region. And um, you can see in this case that even if the product is not fully functional or the perception of quality is not particularly high, um, the satisfaction is still above uh, that zero baseline there. The customer is still satisfied. And what this is typically related to is a feature or function that you weren't expecting that you were pleasantly surprised about. And so in the same example of buying a vehicle, maybe uh, you just discovered that uh, you're gonna get a voice activated um, phone at uh, no charge with your, your new vehicle. That would certainly be um, an exciter and, and a delighter. So that's the attractors region made up of quadrants one and two. And then finally, this line um, is the one-dimensional requirements, and uh, the function and satisfaction of the customer are linear related. And so an example of that might be normally you go to the dentist and you have to wait 20 minutes to see her, and now she's working on improving that, and she's got it down to 10 minutes, and now you're even more satisfied in that experience in, in visiting with your dentist. So it's a linear relationship. The sooner she can see you, uh, the, the less time you have to wait, the more uh, satisfied you are with that service that uh, your dentist is providing.
Well, how to use these Kano diagrams. Now, we're not going to have data, but there is an example in your Demadver notebook, and I actually took screenshots of that, and just give you an idea of how data from a Kano survey would be used. Um, so you'll get an idea of, of how this data can be useful to us as engineers. And you see a rating scale here from one to five that's uh, number one is not useful, all the way up to five is excellent, and three is right in the middle is, is satisfactory. So what you do with this uh, data that you're getting is you uh, look at the percentage of responses uh, with regard to a certain customer requirement or feature that have ratings above satisfactory. So um, they're above, they're above average, they're satisfactory to excellent. And you also look at those that are just satisfactory and then those that are below and determine the percentage of those critical to quality requirements or those, those uh, features that engineers are going to introduce in this product and determine the percent of responses that are either satisfactory, uh, not below satisfactory or above satisfactory. You're then going to take um, the time to look at how important each of those features is based on a scale of 1 to 10. So if we go to an example that's similar to the one with a dentist, where uh, some people apparently were surveyed with how quickly a help desk was responsive to them in, in, in addressing their, their concerns or their questions. And something like 89.5% of the people said that was uh, four or above on a scale of one to five. So clearly, that's a very important customer requirement or a feature uh, that we'd want to see in this process um, where helping people at a help desk is involved. And so because um, that was rated so highly by so many people, that particular attribute was given a ranking of 10 in this Kano survey. So very, very important response time on a help desk. Um, at that point, once you've assimilated this data and gone through this ranking process and determined how many of these customer requirements are satisfactory or above satisfactory or below, rank them. Uh, then you want to start looking at uh, how you can quantify these metrics, how you can start attaching measurements to these critical quality uh, elements. Certainly in the case of the response time at a desk, it might even be something like minutes or seconds. So you're looking at attaching metrics to these. Um, you then want to try to define the degree of correlation between what your customer is telling you, remember VOC stands for voice of the customer, and the critical to quality data uh, so that you can identify uh, relational measure, measures. So you're listening to what the customer is telling you and yet you have this critical to quality data that you've collected through this uh, Kano survey, and now you need to make an effort uh, to relate those two, to identify some relationships between what they're telling you and what the data is telling you. Uh, and then you want to review these relationships between the metrics and uh, try to reduce the data set or try to um, refine it so that you get rid of some irrelevant metrics or duplicate metrics. You basically clean up the data to reduce the amount of data. And then finally, you perform a benchmark analysis uh, using competitive ratings from a Kano questionnaire. So now you have them looking at a, a competitor's product, answering similar questions about it. And so they've told your marketing department uh, what the critical to quality parameters are. They've responded to this with data. Uh, and now you're trying to um, apply the same kind of information to competitive products. Now, we don't have all this data again, but I wanted you to just see how this um, data is collected and how these Kano diagrams are actually uh, constructed. So in this particular case, you notice we have CTQ ranking. Well, that's our critical to quality ranking. That's what our customer has told us. That's basically this um, voice of the customer. And you'll notice that we have a quality perception that's going to go on the horizontal axis of this Kano diagram. And then we have a satisfaction level. Now, we're ranking everything with uh, around some average. And so you'll notice that the plot here, uh, the average looks to be maybe uh, like 2.25 or something. And so anything below that would be um, 
uh, low quality on this axis, high quality on the opposite side, satisfied with our customer and uh, dissatisfied with our customers. And so here are the quality perceptions and then the satisfaction level that people have with that particular level of quality. So in terms of the durability of the product, um, the people responded to this current Kano survey by saying um, on a scale of uh, one to five, it was satisfactory and that their satisfaction level was also satisfactory. If you come down here and look at, say, uh, they're looking at a product that can withstand environmental challenges, maybe dropping something into water or stepping on it, um, whatever this particular product was that they were, were answering questions about, they said that their quality perception um, was three and that their uh, satisfaction level with that level of quality was five. So they're okay with the quality perception being uh, somewhere around average. Uh, however, if you go down to quick charge, this is apparently something that we need to get charged very quickly. Uh, quality perception was four, but uh, satisfaction level with four still wasn't satisfactory enough. So they want that as high as they can possibly, possibly get it. So satisfaction level with four um, still wasn't adequate for our customers. So although, so that's going to put us down in here in that quadrant where uh, our satisfaction level is still very high. Uh, our quality is still very high, but satisfaction is low. So that would be one of those must-haves, um, long battery life or quick charge. The next thing is uh, looking at how engineers propose to meet these various requirements, and they're they're taking their ideas and applying them to another type of survey, maybe the same group of people or another group of people saying, hey, you say you want this uh, product to be durable, and so we have some ways of making it shock resi uh, resistant, and uh, tell us what your perception of this particular idea is in terms of making this product durable. And, and they, they agree, yes, a quality perception of four, but their satisfaction level with this proposed shock resistance is three. It's, it's okay. Um, so it's right in the middle. If we come down here and say, how about a uh, chic, easy uh, uh, charger case? Uh, and, uh, and they say, well, you know, that's uh, uh, an important parameter. It's, you know, we're seeing the quality of that as a four. Uh, we're expecting high performance there, but satisfaction level uh, with your proposed uh, design, um, we're not very satisfied with. So you see how this works. And then they come down here and map this data on these Kano diagrams. And you see we have some here in, uh, in quadrant one, which means that's, a, that's where we want to be. Uh, anywhere above this um, average satisfaction uh, line, it, if we're either in quadrant one or two, that's, that's very useful. Uh, even if our quality is low, uh, the customer is still uh, satisfied with it. You, do, you see we have some down here in quadrant four, though, and that's a big uh, concern because our customers are telling us these proposed changes, uh, they're must-haves. And if they're not there, uh, even if their satisfaction level is uh, very high, even if their um, uh, the quality is very high, even if the quality is very high, uh, they're going to be disappointed if those features aren't in the in the design. So you start to see how these Kano diagrams can help us determine uh, prioritizing customer requirements and thinking about what can we do to get over here in this kind of innovation invention quadrant where we're surprising our customer with some nice features uh, or if we have a design that's putting us in this high quality high satisfaction quadrant how do we stay there and if we're competing with a product that's there and we're not how do we work our way into that into that high satisfaction high quality uh, quadrant. So that's our coverage of uh, Kano diagrams and in the context of what you're doing for uh, this course I would encourage you to think about those uh, Garvin list of eight uh, things that constitute quality for your design and it, it would, might even be helpful for you to put together a Kano diagram and, and get your clients perceptions on what how satisfied they might be with a certain level of performance. Uh, it might be a very high performance level, but again, if it's expected to be that high, um, you, you need to make sure you embed that critical to quality 
parameter in your in your design. Um, otherwise, uh, we're going to end up with something that's expected that's not not there. So that's our coverage of uh, of Kano diagrams. I hope you find them useful.